we're here again with Peter Lakatos and um, joined by my co-host Daniel Paulson. So um, yeah, a few topics that really delve into the relationship between breathing and performance. One is functional movement and how, you know, the question is, can you have functional movement without having functional breathing? Is it a mistake for people to focus solely on just movement without any consideration of the breath? And especially when we are going to learn that they're very much intertwined. And Peter Lakatos, and I'll ask Peter just to introduce himself. He's a, a very interesting character. I've met Peter quite a number of times. I've went over to Budapest, we've done trainings. And I know that you have a black belt in martial arts, Peter. I think you have. I'm pretty sure you have. Yes, sir. Um, you're also a background in BJJ. And you've also coached Elish, um, resc not rescue, but bodyguards and um, different forces, etc. So this is about all things Brett in terms of performance. So, so Peter, just why are you interested in the Brett, by the way? What was so, your background? How did you come across yeah, it? Yeah, so my background, and, and first of all, thank you for inviting me. It's, it's really humbling to be your guest. So, oh, I, and I mean it. Wrong. No, I mean it. Uh, so my background is, is, uh, is uh, a professional athlete. I was playing uh, European handball. I'm just saying European because for Americans, it's a different sport. So it's a team handball as they know it. And uh, quite frankly, you know, breeding for me, that was, I mean, as an athlete, it was just, just keep breathing. That was the, all the instructions we got from coaches. I mean, uh, try to do it without it, right? It, there was no instructions. There were no screening. There was pretty much nothing. Uh, and and uh, the first thing was that I started to really think about breathing was through FMS, what you mentioned, which is Functional Movement uh, System uh, by Lee Burton and Gray Cook. And uh, Brad Jones, who is the, who's one of the, the founder, he was talking about, um, about breathing. And it was a very interesting context, context because, you know, in FMS, what we do, we have seven screens. These are movement screens. And we try to figure out and filter out, uh, let's say, not so good quality movements to figure out like, you know, what is not the baseline for movement and what is good, what is not so good, what needs to be corrected. And if you have any pain. So we try to put everything into different buckets. So anyway, Brad Jones told me about like nine, 10 years ago, like, oh, Peter, um, why don't you do, before you make some corrections, let's say shoulder mobility or something else, why don't you give them like a minute of, uh, of breathing exercise? Just put them on their stomach, uh, put the hand under the forehead called uh, crocodile breathing, and just make them sure that they breathe through the nose. Maybe put a, a book on the lumbar so they have to deep breathe and then rescreen them and I'm like oh that's very interesting so so we did I did because I'm teaching these uh, certifications and I asked the people like first measure the shoulder mobility behind your 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 back and just notice by centimeters how big is is the distance between the two hands do the exercise which is the breathing it's about one minute breathing deep breathing crocodile breathing and then let's see what's the difference and then and then we measure so it's, it's very measurable, if you think about it. And it's just one minute. And my surprise, 90% of the people put their hands up when I asked them, like, so how many had positive change after one minute breathing? It was 90%. And in my opinion, if it's 90%, we buy it. We should. I mean, that's pretty high level, right? So I was like, it's, that doesn't make any sense. So that was my first thing. Like, okay, I'm, I'm very convinced this breathing stuff is working. I just don't know how. I don't know why. But I cannot, you know, there are things you, but what you've seen, now you cannot unseen ever. So this 90%, you've seen it. And then you're like, okay, so what is that? And this is when I started to have to, to I mean, uh, read and, and, and search for sources. And this is how I found your book. And, and a couple of years later, you've been in our house and having a dinner. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. And it's, it's been amazing that it's been overlooked. But now there's definitely a greater awareness of breathing. Just that's very interesting. You, you had people lie on their front, 
there you were they were lying face down resting on their hands and you put the book just at the diaphragm area just on the lower mm-hmm. back mm-hmm. and the objective was that as they breathe it in that the book was rising Correct. so as the diaphragm was moving downwards you've got movement to the back movement to the front and movement to the sides yes yeah, I wonder why you had them lie in their front as opposed to so, lying so, in supine position. So, okay, so I can I can answer this question, or at least I'm trying to answer. So I can put them on the back, and the great thing when I put them on the back is very simple. It will uh, put the spine in a neutral position, right? Especially if they are able to pull their legs up, because many people, when their legs are straight, they open. They open up like this. And this is, this is basically, you know, like they, they live in the, in the breathing in position, mm. if, if it makes sense, right? Yeah. So, and this is the problem when we talk about, and this is from Yanda, and he called this uh, open scissor syndrome, right? So basically, if you are in this position, all the, the sheer forces are on your lumbar two and three, which is not the best. So, so basically, I can put them on the back. But here comes another uh, subset or phenotype of uh, postural problems. So one of them is, we call them the ski jumper because then people can remember, right? This is a typical ski jumper position. The other guy is the caveman, right? A typical, I'm sorry to be not PC, but a typical bodybuilder, let's say, you know, like the person who has also just have Monday and Wednesday, which is chest and arm, right? So they are in this position. So if I put this guy into, on his back, there is, there is no force to make him open. But if I put them on the stomach, then in this position, I have to extend them. And then I start to make them uh, breathe. So all the muscles start to relax around the spine. The diaphragm gets to... to uh, uh, basically invited into this whole working process. So finally, the diaphragm is doing what it should do. And then again, when they stand up, they look, I mean, these guys, they definitely look taller when they get up. So the posture is changing. Uh, And again, it's just simply when somebody walks to my room, sometimes I don't have time to to, uh, screen them, to do the full screen. So I just do one or two screens with them. Let's say the shoulder mobility is very telling. And then based on the posture, I already know where I'm going to put them for breathing, right? And then I take a picture of them as they put the hand behind them, mm-hmm. breathing after picture, and I show them like, okay, so, so your reach mm-hmm. in one minute gained about 15 to 20 uh, centimeters, which is very normal. And then they are like, whoa, this is amazing. I want more of this. That's cool. What's What's about that, Daniel? Peter, you, you, you're talking about hunching over. And as an old tennis player, uh, well, not even old tennis players, but tennis players in general, they have this, and, and I have too much, so you're, you're almost in, this is your natural position. So that, mm-hmm. that's very interesting, actually. Uh, well, the, one of the problem is in most sports that they practice so much the given sport and this is again not from me, it's from again from Brad Jones. They start to live in the sport posture, like like the boxer, they start to live in the fighting stance. So like shoulder forward, head is, is chin is down because protecting the chin. So you will see pretty much most of the sports they start to live in the posture, and and that is one of the reason that you know when somebody comes to us and says like I want to have some kind of safe fitness tip, what am I supposed to do? it would be great to give them bicycling because it's safe if you think about it. but But if you sit already 12 hours a day at the desk, you are basically just making that bad posture stronger if you're going to do bicycling, let's say, two hours a day extra. So, so it's, again, it's always the safe, the, the risk benefit ratio. And in this case, risk is very low on the knee and hip and ankle and spine because you're bicycling, but the posture is very high risk. So probably it's not the best for you. But even bicycling, I would say, if you lean over, mm-hmm. 
uh, your diaphragm will be it will be hot, harder to to move that, especially since you're you're cycling for hours. Yeah. Sometimes. So, no, it, so, yeah, so I think I think leaning forward, it's in this position because you are conserved in a in a very strong flexion, mm-hmm. probably for hours. Probably it's a horrible idea by any standard. Now also, so when we'd have like, let's say a team handball game and there are switches, the players, right? So one player comes down with probably like 180 uh, beats per minute heart rate and they have to sit down, right? Because that's the rule. Just like in ice hockey, you have to sit down if you leave the court. We always emphasize them to put your your uh, elbow on your thigh, making sure that you are you have straight back, not run back, but you are resting your upper body, mm-hmm. your torso on your legs. And we measured with, uh, with heart rate monitors. And it's, here comes a very interesting uh, 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 thing what we saw. The moment when, when we, because the diaphragm has two, at least two, but many more uh, duties. One of them is respiration, but the other is, uh, to stabilize the spine. So, but when you are above your anaerobic threshold, it's very difficult to decide for the brain which one is most important. Of course, respiration will be more important because that's survival. Mm. So then when you sit down and, and you give some support for your upper body, now that the diaphragm can just focus on one thing and one thing only respiration. So heart rate drops almost like two times faster. So it's crazy. It's a s- small trick, but that's what we use for players. And you go through that again, Peter. Sorry. I think that's really, really important. So say, for example, um, you've got an MMA fighter, and it's, it's just one, round, one minute, isn't it, is, is the rest in between rounds. So yes. his or her heart rate is ramped up. Mm. So they're sitting on the stool. Is there anything that they can do while sitting on the stool or... Or does so, it have to be a specific purpose kind of? So, so if you don't mind, I would switch a little bit because I'm, I'm probably a lot less experienced in MMA, but probably more in uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Mm-hmm. And, because, and I give you an uh, interesting uh, point of view, which is very similar to um, Judo, that you know, many times they have to, che- um, to, to check the clothing and retie the belt. So then they, you have to turn around, you go to the size of position and you have to, again, you know, do the whole thing. And this is what we found like a, a, a very good opportunity, first of all, to, to go down with your heart rate and, and changing the acidity of your blood. So in this case, what we do with our fighters is very simple. You turn around and you start to hyperventilate, of course, because right now you have very high level of acidity. And you have some time. So they very slowly, but surely they, they tie their bell. They put everything in the right order. They stand up. They show they are ready. So they will get the jima. And then, and then uh, most likely in that time, acidity is starting to get lowered, but also heart rate. And we do the same thing if there is a break. In, in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, there's no break. So there are five uh, seconds, six, uh, five minutes, six uh, minutes, seven minutes. Black belts are 10 minutes fights. So there you only chance is basically when your belt is, is fallen or your jacket is out, and then you have chance to, you know, win some time and, and, and get rested. I'm just wondering as well. So they're taking full big breaths, but I'm sure they're breathing low. So it's, it's improving alveolar ventilation. Mm-hmm. Do you do anything with the exhalation? Do you kind of slow down the exhalation at all to at the stimulate end. the vagus nerve towards the end? Yeah. So at the end, we start to do, at, if it's possible, we do like 30, 40, relatively fast breathing, mm-hmm. which normally would probably make you pass out mm-hmm. in normal life. But here, it's not going to happen because yes. your CO2 is very high. Yes. Hydrogen ions are very high. Acidity is definitely very high. And and then start to slow down your breathing as you're turning back. And especially because of the, the, the parasympathetic, the tone, you try to bring it back. Mm-hmm, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's an interesting take. 
it, it's always, I suppose, yeah, just for, for people listening in, if you normally were to do 20 or 30 breaths, you could bring on lightheadedness. And even with the physical exercise, the, the carbon dioxide in the blood, the, it, it's, even though the metabolism can be generating so much CO2, so there's a higher production. So what you're saying is the higher production of carbon dioxide, you get away with doing the hyperventilation that you're not going to feel the so it's it's a great yeah um this is going to be an interesting one i know we were bringing it in i don't think we looked into it enough in detail and this is this is all things good about breathing you know there's so many different it's getting it down into the fine details so yeah, it, yeah it's interesting peter with your your buy-in uh, you know that you in any sport you have, i think you have to find various ways for athletes to accept it and in general i would say individual athletes are more accepting to try new things and and with breathing and if you take martial arts it seems to be a much higher acceptance rates within martial arts and i think it's is it due to tradition that it's already from when you start off or what we mm -hmm. say why compared to team sports where? first of all yeah so first of all the i think because of uh, of the traditionally most martial arts come from asia and in Asia, breathing was also part of the different kind of religious practices. So I would say that must be one of the reason. So not just the performance part, but also the, the you know, probably what they were talking about that. And I'm not expert on that level. All my connections to China is my wife is Chinese. So that's, that's the maximum. But, you know, they talk about the chi and the, the energy and everything. So, and, and breathing was always part of it as I read uh, all these uh, uh, literatures, but uh, but the other thing is the experience. So especially if it's somehow related to wrestling type of movements, you very soon will understand how important is your breathing, because simply the amount of pressure on you, the amount of uh, acidity you have to deal with, is so ridiculous. And it works vice versa. So we have sometimes uh, kickboxers, Muay Thai fighters, boxers come to Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and, and high level. And then they feel they die after one minute because simply the acidity is so high and they never met with that type of pressure. And of course, if you go to boxing training, they will beat us up. So it's, it goes vice versa. But, uh, but, but if, again, here comes the one of the typical answer probably nobody likes to hear that it depends because again you know hyperventilation when somebody asks me that um, what do you think about hyperventilation i will say it depends and they're like what do you mean well if you are above an orbit threshold and you try to get your breathing you know dialed in probably hyperventilation is a good idea it's controlled it's limited in time and the moment when you reach a certain level, you stop it, right? Now, but hyperventilation, when uh, you are you are just uh, sitting and uh, doing nothing, well, you're better sitting because you might have so much lightheadedness that you might even pass out. So probably then it doesn't make much sense, according to me. I'm not saying I know everything, but that would be my opinion. Yeah, it's, it's very, very interesting because when I, like when you mix different sports, I think... Uh, Patrick, I've told, uh, spoken about this um, a lot. I think you have to be very specific for that sport because if you talk to an athlete in whatever sport, uh, it has to be dialed into that sport. And, 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 and especially now when you have, like you were saying in, in the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, I think when it was black belt, was it 10 minutes and no, no, no pause? No, no break. No. no break, which is completely different from uh, a four-hour tennis match in a Grand Slam mm -hmm. where you have multiple breaks, uh, you know, you have, uh, you know, between the points in the changeover. So you have the time to to come down, but it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's all about the endurance versus something that is very, very intense. But breathing is still important in both those instances, but you have to, you have to prepare in different ways. And what you can do during the actual competition mm -hmm. is, is different. So, uh, that's why I think there's not one size fits all because you have to you have to adapt it to this specific sport. So you know in tennis there's always this pause of 90 seconds, so you know that you can always go from that 25 seconds in between points. But if you're 10 minutes in a, uh, in a competition in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, 
how do you what how do you think about your breathing before then how do you prepare uh, what would you say to somebody who's going into competition so again um, and this is again not my idea this is mainly from patrick but but uh, what we use normal is very simple we do the if it's competition of course so we're going to do the relaxation breathing uh, probably one or two hours prior even 30 minutes prior the the event and then about 10 minutes prior we're going to do strong breath holds to to have the the splenic effect mm -hmm. and uh, and hopefully we did our homework before so so we did everything else prior but these are just the last fine tuning of the system and then naturally before we start probably we're going to do some four to four six meaning the the rhythmic uh, breathing so four in six out to calm the mind because uh no matter how strong they are, how experienced they are, nobody is completely relaxed before they go to, the, to, to a fight. That's impossible. I mean, even in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, where there's a very little chance that, that you will have some serious damage on the body. But imagine the same thing with cage fighting, where you have no idea what's the outcome. I mean, seriously, very little chance you can project the fight that you will go without injuries or even surgeries. So, so th then I think even uh, uh, the risk is higher. And, and in my eyes, the, the highest risk definitely be the first responders. So meaning SWAT units and everything, because then you, you actually, you don't even know if you go home. So that's a, a, a third level of, of very high level risk. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is like, coming back to your question, Daniel, why people in, why warriors of old tend to focus on the breath? It just kind of makes, it, mean, it makes, makes total sense because it's not just about training the body, but it's also about training the mind. You can imagine a fighter who goes into a ring and that person has their attention all stuck in their head. Or you can imagine a fighter who goes into the ring and their attention is fully engaged in what they are doing. But Peter, I know you're working with your athletes in terms of improving concentration and focus and attention span is it something that normally happens because we all have attention to different and varying degrees some of us have very poor attention span that was me 20 years ago 25 years ago others have it pretty well they have a natural ability to have a very good attention span our education system hasn't taught us how to improve it and it's a totally different story if you're sending a fighter out and if they're going to be distracted by the least thing or if they're so stuck or distracted with all of the thoughts going through the minds. Mm -hmm. So they'll have external distractions and they have internal distractions. Um, what do you go through? You know, my, my question, I suppose, is do all fighters focus on training their mind? Is it something that's happening and the breath is a, as a good gateway into doing that? So in my opinion, that most of the fighters and most of the athletes of, of any kind, basically, for them, uh, breath training is not part of the, the daily routine. And, and while we try to focus and we like to focus on performance with these guys, but when you make a step back, you will figure out most of them are snoring. Most of them has probably borderline sleep apnea. Uh, they, they regeneration is, is definitely horrible. Uh, so even though if they spend enough time in the bed, most likely they are not sleeping. So, and these are the guys that Olympic level, um, you know, swimmers, water polo. So I, I, I worked with these guys and I was always shocked that that um, the breathing was how the similar to the civilian counterparts like there was no difference in uh, breath holding times either the steps exercise or the bolt score it was very similar and one of the thing was when i was working with a high level water polo team women i asked them um, as I, I was trying to break the ice so i asked them that okay so how many of you are snoring and they were very offended. And they said, like, no, we are, not, we are women. We are not snoring. And, and I was like, okay, all right. Got it. Got, good. And I was like, okay, so when you go to training camps, are you in pairs, right, in the room? And they said, yes. I was like, okay, so put your hand up if your partner is snoring. So everybody put up the hands. I was like, so, okay, so how does it work? Like, nobody's snoring, but everybody's partner is snoring. So everybody's snoring. 
And they were like, yeah, pretty much. But and then and then some started to like defend themselves. Yeah, but only when we are tired. I'm like, okay, when was the last time you were not tired? I mean, these are like highest level uh, players, and they're like, well, yeah, that's a good point. So, and and just you know, again, ask them to to how many of you have or using uh, often uh, nose drops, and it's. Again, high-level players, handball, water polo, it doesn't really matter. I never counted less than 20, 25% mm. of these athletes. Which is reflective of the population. It's in yes. around 30% so, again, of the population with rhinitis. And I suppose mm-hmm. then the connection then, Peter, is if they're using nose drops or if there's a tendency towards a stuffy nose, they've got an increased risk of sleep disorder breathing. So mm-hmm. what you're saying is it's, it's pretty much across all walks of life. Um, an interesting comment you made with regards to SWAT, SWAT guys and the guy yesterday I was working with elite police as well and you know in, in terms of the application of breathing exercises to upregulate to downregulate to you know you can imagine going into a scenario that you're absolutely ramped up and everybody is going to be ramped up you know, especially if, if the, the outcome, you know, it could be as, as drastic as losing a life. That's really, you know, that's a, a, another level entirely. When you're teaching the breathing exercise to downregulate, you spoke about the four seconds in and six seconds out. Is that something that you normally prescribe? I think it's a pretty good one to do. I think it's a great one for stimulating the vagus nerve. Yes. So I, I think that the difficulty for these groups of people is the very fact that you have no idea what's going to happen. So you can only rely on your knowing that you had the best training possible and you have the best team possible. And you have to basically hang on these two facts. Uh, And if you don't trust any of those, meaning your training or your your group of people, your confidence level is so low, so you're definitely going to make some mistake. That's my experience from talking to many of these the, and working some of these uh, units. And uh, if we just step back one, uh, we know that, uh, I, and, and I don't know how uh, exact is the study, but now what they talk about, we have 6,200 thought verbs per day, and most likely over... 80% of them are just repetitive and useless and just uh, full of fear. So just uh, as an interesting part, I was working with a special unit in Israel and I asked them about this, like, okay, so how do you deal with all these things? And they said, well, um, very important to understand best team, best training. And when I go in, everything is under my control. That is what I try to do the best way possible. Everything but is under not my control, I don't even think about it mm-hmm. because then it would just take my attention away. And he said, uh, if, I'm, if we succeed, that's a teamwork. If I die, that's not my problem anymore anyway. Mm-hmm. That's what they said. So I'm just quoting. And I was like, okay, that's very interesting. So, 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 and the funny thing is that if you go out with them to have a dinner, lunch, coffee, whatever, they are the most relaxed people because they always like, you know, my work is is just the just crazy yeah and compared to that what might happen here nothing i mean compared to that stress level this is nothing so if the the waitress is not giving you the warm food it's a little bit you know not as warm whatever like what's the conflict here this is basically nothing compared to what i'm dealing with every day yeah yeah so that's what i see first of all and i also remember when um when uh, especially I, I asked one AI in who is my teacher in uh, in Krav Maga, and he told me a story, and I don't know if it's true, but that's what he told me, uh, that uh, Imi, who was uh, Imi Lichtenfeld, who was the founder of Krav Maga, he was uh, uh, part of the team. He was preparing that special Mosa unit to to catch um, um, Adolf Eichmann, right? Uh, in I believe in Argentine, and. Uh, some of the exercises, again, I'm saying what I, what I was heard, but one of the exercises was because they had to spend a lot of time in a car and waiting for the right time to catch the guy. And they said, uh, Imi was teaching them special breathing exercises. Because when you have to go, you have to sprint and catch the guy. 
Mm -hmm. But before that, you have to be amazingly calm. And he very early figured out that even if he teaching them the best techniques, if they are not relaxed, they cannot recall the, the, all the information they studied. So, and it totally makes sense, to be honest. Totally, totally. Well, if we're ramped up in a fight or flight response, the body has only got one, one motive and that's survival. That's to get the hell out of there. It's not about recalling information. And that's mm -hmm. for down regulation. And these guys, like, they're focusing. They have to have 100% focus, maybe for one hour at a time, maybe two hours, maybe three hours, maybe more. Like, you can imagine a normal individual trying to maintain that focus. They're mm -hmm. going to be lost in daydreams. Their mind is going to be all over the place. And yes, these guys can't afford that opportunity because if they miss, if they miss that timing... Um, just I have one more question before Daniel comes in. In terms of the guys that when you were talking to, if we were to measure their stress levels, do you think that their stress levels are high? Do you think they've got a good balance in the autonomic nervous system? Do you think that it has been their training and whether there's um, a role for breath work in terms of putting a stress on them to make them more resilient to achieve a better balance of the autonomic nervous system. So I know there's a couple of questions there, but. Mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, regarding to the human body, pretty much everything is a skill. Yes. So if it's a skill, then, uh, then it's trainable. And, and I think that's what they do. The first of all, when you ask them about whatever they can say about what happened, but let's say they can say the way they talk about it, like, like uh, kids are talking about hide and seek. For them, it's fun, and that drives me nuts, to be honest, because uh, this is something that you would we would definitely freak out. And and again, I was working with some of the units, and they have this so-called tactical house, when they sh can shoot either with live ammo or simunition, which is almost like paintball, but a lot more painful. And we use this uh, basically, and they have to do a task. They have to go from room to room, catch somebody. So there is a task. And there is always a group of people. They're monitoring them. Probably there are cameras, and uh, they have uh, probably uh, HR monitor on them. So, so it depends on you know, what, what level we are talking, how much money we are talking about. But it was very interesting. So they know it's a training. They exactly know this is a not a live weapon. And, and nothing is risky right now. And even though in that case, we measured sometimes uh, 200, 210 beats per minute. So that was, that was super crazy. So when I first saw that, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is like, like an Olympic level 800 meters at the end. They completely acidic, completely blocked. I mean, really like, like tunnel vision, like crazy. And, and the reason we have cameras in these rooms are very simple because then we ask them what happened. And this is where the surprise comes because according to what happened and what happened really objectively is two different story. Like, and it can be so different. Some people said like, I shot three times, uh, blah, blah, blah. And then we could prove on a video that you never pulled the trigger. So, and that was not a high stress and this was elite unit. I mean, not elite, some, it was wow. sub elite unit yet. Yeah. So it's, it's amazing that how much stress it can be even in training environment so it's hard to imagine what is real life mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, would that uh, would that be uh i asked you a question before peter about uh, the preparation and we do the same thing uh, of course because it's from from uh from patrick would you do the down regulation a few hours before to reduce anxiety and upregulate but if you take two different sports, and for the sake of argument, you take Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, no pauses, high intensity for 10, 10 minutes, you don't know the outcome. Uh, I don't know if you can end it before 10 minutes, and then you have a tennis match for four hours. Should you shift, because you may be anxious in different ways, should you have more or less uh, of the down regulation versus the up regulation, depending on the type of intensity, time of duration of the actual competition because going in i'm just assuming going into brazilian the, the anxiety levels could be very high so 
what would you recommend to different sports like that? So first of all, the most important part, we have to understand those sports. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have, as a coach, I don't have to understand as much as uh, a tennis coach, mm -hmm. but I have to understand the physiology of the sport, the challenge of the sport. Mm -hmm. uh, even from, from the, the, the typical injuries, overuse injuries of the sport, uh, typical movements of the sports, uh, uh, the demand of the sports. This is how far I, I, I have to go. Uh, and I will, would never teach them tennis because that doesn't make any sense. Mm. But understanding that how many sprints, i give you an exa example. Okay, so probably this will help. I was hired like four years ago for a Division I handball team uh, as a strength coach. And uh, so I sat down with the head coach and I asked him, so what is the tactics for the year? And, and he said like, um, why we are brand new in division one, I want to surprise the league. So the way we, we purchase that, the players, the extra players are pretty fast. And I, I want to play fast games. And I was like, mm, that's, that's, that's a good, you're already helping me. So tell me how many sprints you are buying here. And he said about 60, 65 sprints per player. I'm like, cool. So that's how we're going to train. So I had three months. Mm -hmm. And our focus was basically, especially with the wings, to, to make sure that they are able to make that many sprints in a very high speed. And uh, again, as a fresh team, we became fourth in the league that year. So that was pretty amazing. That was really surprising because simply what we were focusing on sprints and again, breathing. So that was another thing that that was difficult to sell to the head coach that we were doing the, the maximum breath hold exercises. Uh, we were doing the 40 meter sprints with the uh, breathing out and, and just uh, all out basically. Uh, and, and so I, because at the beginning, everybody was like, oh, that's pretty crazy. They've never seen this before. That and then, but that was again. We could call, we could measure because you know we could see the the ball score of the average was seventeen second uh, preseason, and after the preparation, it was above twenty five. So that was pretty good. And then we could measure the steps again. Steps was about forty five average. Then it went up to above eighty average. So again, it was really good. So we knew that they can repeat the sprints and the same way I'm working with division one uh, football players who they come to me with again, about 15 to 17 seconds of a ball score. And now we are about 40 normally with, with some of them. And uh, the maximum uh, breathlessness test is, it was about 52. And now one of my player is 106, which is pretty good. Mm. And it's funny that, it's not my job to make them faster sometimes, but how many times they can be fast is my job. Meaning they are pretty fast, but as they getting more acidic because of the load, so this is a kind of an answer to your question, then, um, then they start to slow down. But if they can handle more acidity or remove hydrogen ions faster, whatever, or, or buffering better the hydrogen ion, then we, we bought them more sprints. And suddenly, and this is true story with this player, he was the, the third slowest guy and he became the fifth fastest guy in the team uh, within less than a season, like six months. Mm. And, and again, he was fast already on some degree, but repetitive sprint ability, which is uh, in tennis, in volleyball, basketball, handball, football, is the number one skill besides the sports specific skill that is very difficult to, to improve without breathing exercises, in my opinion. Mm. Yeah, I would agree. It makes total sense. And it, it makes total sense to add an extra load onto the person's breathing. As you were talking about, take a normal breath in and out, pinch your nose, hold, and sprint for 40 meters with a breath mm. hold and we do a departure every 30 seconds. Like those, it's very taxing. And you know, sometimes when you're working with players and they're thinking that breathing is, uh, 
it's it's a load of nonsense and then you put them through this they soon change their tune but they feel it their legs are going jelly mm-hmm. they feel that you're really pushing the boundaries but we're doing it within safe limits to get those adaptations yes and even at this level peter you know if an athlete achieves a half a percent improvement and it's possible with breathing because breathing has been the one thing that that has been overlooked so mm-hmm. here is an entire state that has the, the possibility for great potential, but it has been overlooked. So any player who starts just looking at this and bringing it into their existing routine, you know, the, the, the possibility is there. Can I give you one more example? Mm. Because that was definitely eye-opening for pretty much everybody. Mm-hmm. And, and that's what we call a uh, nose breathing max uh, exercise. And so we have a lake around, uh, we have a lake next to the handball court and there is a running court around the lake. So it's pretty, it's, it's pretty nice. Mm-hmm. And what we do with them, because traditionally in handball and football, uh, preseason, everybody's running right crazy. Like, but to be honest, I'm not so confident to let them run because some of them are like 100, 105, 110 kilo handball players. Mm. So the mechanical stress is ridiculously high. So I'm, I'm kind of hesitant to make them run so much, long study cardio style. So what we do is we make them walk, right? We even put the tape on if, if possible. Uh, and they are very much partner in it. And we do it very simply. Everybody has their heart rate monitor. And we make them walk around the lake two or three times. That's about 30 to 45 minutes. And this is preseason. So we, they do it three times a week. And, and again... It's nose breathing. So some of them are very fast walking, no running, very fast walking. So the mechanical stress on the knees, the hip and the spine is minimum, but the breathing is forced through the nose. Everything, the, the, the mouth is, is closed and some of them are walking up themselves to 160 beats per minute and they keep it, right? So they're very really fat, uh, really fit. And then the, the amazing part is that because when we started to do that, pretty much everybody's questioned our, you know, sanity. Like they were like, this is not pretty much nobody's doing this. I'm like, it's either good or bad. We'll see. And turned out it's pretty good because at the end of the year, not just because of that, but I think because of that too, we have two very interesting uh, uh, data came in. Number one, we are in the whole division after finishing the year who had no major injuries whole year, which is in handball, it's unheard of. Mm-hmm. So even the head coach said, like, I never seen anything like that. Mm-hmm. And the other thing is through the COVID, and I don't want to claim anything, but we are the team that almost had no any uh, COVID illnesses or none of, the, none of the postponed games were postponed because our player was sick. But because of the other team, mm-hmm. players were sick. And, and I think it's because they became nose breeders, uh, probably because better recovery, the nitric oxide, most possibly a part of it. And, and again, just um, the, the diaphragm got stronger. And I think this is where, where the, the, the money is probably that, you know, in, because the breath holding, most people doesn't understand, most coaches, when we do a breath holding, when we have the first urge, as Patrick is always talking about the first urge, now when you have the maximum breathlessness test, it's not the first urge. Mm-hmm. It's the, it's, you go more beyond. So there is a static or isometric of the, of the diaphragm. It's, it's shaking. It wants to work. You just mm-hmm. decide not to. So basically you isometrically strengthening the diaphragm because if it's a muscle, you can train it, right? If it's a muscle, you can give hypertrophy. If it's a muscle, you can put more mitochondria in it, which we know from Russian research, diaphragm, when it gets thicker, have more mitochondria and takes more lactic acid. So basically whatever you create as lactate, the diaphragm take it as food, as energy substrate which is pretty amazing. Mm. So in this case, I think it's, it's almost like a double whammy in, because you know they got the, the nose breathing in, but the stronger diaphragm and a stronger and more functioning diaphragm is protecting the spine 
And when the spine is protected, everything is protected because that's what we call the fixed point of the whole body. So compared to that, we can move our arms or legs. If the spine is uh, wobbly, then the whole body goes into startle reflex and pretty much everything is limited as range of motion. Yeah. So that's what we see. But it makes sense to, if you do, uh, like you said, 30 to 40 minutes, almost a half a game or half match in handball in football, mm -hmm. uh, that you do it three times a week during preseason from, I don't know, was it six to eight weeks or how, how many weeks do you do it for? Yeah, the full thing is 12 weeks, but as we do it for about four to six weeks yeah. uh, at the beginning, and it's, we're fading this out yeah. and starts more of sprinting and more of uh, sports specific, like sprinting with balls. And also they have to use, uh, learn the, the tactics of the yeah, game. Yeah. I think yeah. because what people don't always think about is that normally everybody, uh, on a team is injured at some point, more or less during the year. And if you're not injured, you, you can train more and you become fitter. So it's, exactly what you said is very important because yeah. he, this is the thing. And, and I wish more people would say what you said just now. The right, the good athlete is the athlete who shows up on the training. Mm. That is the good athlete. Mm. And, and basically the only way we can create a high level athletes when they show up and they can only show up when they are healthy. So basically, um, when people are getting uh, damaged, injured, and everything, even though they are very skilled, very talented, unfortunately, at one point, the other guy who is less prone to injury, but willing to put the work in, probably will pass them. Mm. I think it's a great training for handball and football. But uh, if you take a different sport, like maybe Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and, and boxing, where you can have lighter, uh, may, maybe that is not as effective maybe you should maybe then you have to adapt it a little bit more intense shorter because they train in a different way but i think for a handball and especially handball it makes perfect sense because like you said they weigh a lot they're big so they still get the training and, he, and also with football for a long almost like a half half uh, match so it's in time and in, in not exactly the same intensity but if they can stay fit throughout the season you know overall they become fitter so that's, again, adapting to the specific sport, which I think is uh, very, very important. I think there's another point there. Um, I try to see always the, the game as a way, what is, what is the energy system is overused? Hmm. So, for example, that a, a glycolytic system for many sports like, uh, like Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, wrestling, Judo, it's overused. Now, we also know that glycolytic system creating a lot of reactive oxygen species. So that means that it's not too healthy. I'm sorry to say that, but, but when you have, you know, seven times, uh, twice a day, uh, grappling all out or crossfitting all out or high intensity interval training all out, it is not safe. It is not healthy. And um, because simply we are creating way too much reactive oxygen species, which will create acidity, which will create uh, most likely membrane problems at the mitochondrial level. So, so many times we, we try to do the opposite with them. Meaning that even in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, this type of uh, walking training is really good because it's giving you uh, work capacity, giving you capillaries giving you uh, the foundation, giving you, they call it the cardiac output, meaning the, you're making the left ventricle bigger. So your heart is getting in a much healthier position when you are doing high intensity interval training mm -hmm. where your heart rate is way high and your heart is just doing this mm -hmm. and just getting way too muscular mm -hmm. in a bad way. And mm -hmm. if you go overboard, so, so we try to create a, a balanced athlete even on that level of physiology. How do you, in CrossFit, I can see that you can have the same exercise more or less and you can no, no spree to stay within more of a healthy range and don't go over the anaerobic threshold. But how do you do that in martial arts if you actually do, can you, is that, because when you do grappling, like I said, can you actually no spree? Can, is, it, is it the same thing? Could you actually go down in intensity? Yeah, so, so what we do in, in and, and you have to be a fairly high level in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and we call it flow grappling. Mm -hmm. So you try to go 
fairly high speed, but nothing strong. Not, you, you are not um, eligible to hold more than for two seconds. Mm. So it's, it's, uh, it's very much flow. It's, it's smooth. It's, it's, uh, you go from position to position. The heart rate could go up, like 160 normally we measure, but it's, it's playful. There is no risk of injury, no risk of losing, no risk of anything, basically. And uh, sometimes uh, the guys are doing this for like 30, 40, 50 minutes mm. without stopping. And everybody's all sweaty and everything. But it's a very good uh, uh, exercise to, d- to dial in new techniques. Mm. But also, it's a good, great fitness exercise. Mm. I'm, I'm actually... Uh, doing a, a, a instructor training for me for the other oxygen advantage coaches this week and it's about finding that anaerobic threshold so you you do 20 seconds one minute of say push-ups or burpees uh, for a couple of minutes and then you no speed and then you do 30 seconds and then you 30 seconds and then you do 40 seconds and you rest 20 seconds and you try to see at what point if at all do you start mouth breathing and that's where you know that's where you're going overboard and you're going into a different mm-hmm. state. So then yes. you can kind of realize, okay, I can do this every minute for 20 seconds, fine. Maybe even 30, but 40 doesn't work. So that is my limit. So that's, the, that's how you keep your buffering below that. So you, you know that you can't go above that. So that's, that's one way of finding well, out. The, the way I force it sometimes with our Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu group is simply we take, we take uh, uh, tapes, we put the tape on, mm-hmm. and this is how we roll. Yep. And that's, that's kind of like self-limiting uh, solution because the moment when the tape is on, nobody wants to run like crazy because mm. yeah. they know that there is a price. Mm. So they slow down, they start to think, and then suddenly they see things that normally don't, they don't see because there's m- much more focus. Mm. That, that's, uh, I know that uh, we're a little bit conscious of time. I think we're... Uh, We've gone almost uh, an hour, so uh, many great uh, nuggets here, Patrick. Mm. And uh, for sure, it's been sorry. tremendous, Peter. Yeah. It's been really good. Well, yeah. I have a good, I have a good teacher, sir. <laughs> that's all I can say. I'm sorry, but that's a, that's the fact. Yeah. Um, with your work with the function movement screen, I'm curious to see of the people that you've tested over the years. What's the percentage of people that you would um, that they would, sh- would that they would indicate that they have dysfunctional dysfunctional movement and dysfunctional breathing, mm-hmm. and the relationship between the two. So, so first of all, um, functional movement FMS had like two researches at least lately, which was one about the questionnaire part, like uh, comparing the different questionnaires about the knee Megan, the entitled, and then the the four questions which was very relevant to the breath hold time of 25 seconds. So I, I used that one as a, as, a, as a very easy check with everybody. Mm-hmm. And that's very shocking that I would say a good 75% are failing on one of those questions. So then we measure the, the, the breath hold times, it's less than 25. And then we measure the screen test and they are below 14 and they show some asymmetries. So it's very relevant, these three measurements. Yeah. That's what I see. And, uh, and, and the, the interesting part is the moment when we, so, so now FMS is considering uh, breathing as movement, right? Mm-hmm. So this is very smart. And they say like, you know, if you're checking the squat, you should check this, the breathing too. I mean, what's the, the big deal? And that's what we do. And then, uh, and, that, and then you can see as the breathing improves, let it be the biomechanics of it or the biochemistry uh, of it, there will be a transfer to everywhere. And i just give you a story. I was working with uh, one of the National Center for Handball players, and these are young handball players from 14 and up. So they're like 400 kids, so it's a big academy. Uh, I was teaching the teachers uh, Oxygen Vantage, like it was a one-day uh, mm-hmm. short course. And, I, and, and after they, they knew what they already knew, I asked them, like, okay, so guys, just, you know, out of your mind, I mean, what would be the percentage of the kids here who think they have a, a problematic breathing? And they said about, about 75, 80%. I mean, based on what we learned now. Kids who taught it, 
that's amazing because usually people have a very poor perception you know normally yeah. if you if you say to somebody your breathing might be a little bit off or your breathing could do with room for improvement and they'll typically say well my breathing is fine yeah. people can be quite defensive about their breathing but yet the kids were very open to it no 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 i these were the teachers oh the, the teachers, teachers said, said about, about the kids, kids. Yes. sorry i picked up wrong it's That's okay amazing. and no it was my hunglish and then uh and then I asked them like, okay, that's, that's, that's doable. I think it's possible now. Okay. So let's talk about posture. So how, what is the percentage you think that these young players, I mean, how many of them have postural issues? And they said, it's about the same. I'm like, that's amazing. So now you see these two normally take an independent values. And if you put it together, you, you think that one is affecting the other and they're like, no question about it. Mm. Like that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's amazing. But it's it's kind of frightening as well the instance, and also the fact that it's been overlooked. You know how many how many elite even if we were to, not even thinking about recreational, but how many elite athletes are considering their breathing, and surely there you know it's 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 really something to be to be embraced. Um, where do you see it? And just with, with the final questions, where do you see it all going? Do you th see a future in breathing? Do you see it's going to be brought into mainstream? Yes. I think the, the, what I see right, especially be, be, because of COVID, probably there yeah. is a lot more focus on, um, especially in recovery, rehabilitation. I can yes. see a lot of interest uh, here. And the reason I, I, I very much see that we have a, a place in this in this uh, movement, it's very simple. It's measurable. Yeah. So yes. so when people are talking about breathing, normally it's something they cannot wrap their head around. Like, okay, breathing, yeah. explain to me. But when we tell them, and it's it's always a little magic when when somebody is measure. You I, you ask the four questions. You measure yes. the the bolt score. So it's let's say fifteen, right? And then at 15, if it's a woman, we exactly know that most likely cold hands and, uh, and uh, food, yeah. and most likely Feeling snoring, sense. exactly. Yeah. And, and most likely the, around the menstrual cycle, they have yes. possibly more pain, but yes. definitely more, more uh, tense. Yes. And then when you, when you tell them these after just a number, like, okay, so according to your number, I think this is what your problem is. Yeah. And they're like, how did you know that? Yeah. Yes. So that, I think that's very eye opening when they, they start yeah. to see that the, the symptoms they carry for some 20 years, yeah. actually uh, the big part, and I'm not saying just this part, but the big part of it is actually breathing related and could be, improved greatly in a couple of weeks yes without yeah. any medication yes i agree i agree i think the measurement is very important and also an understanding of breathing from a number of different dimensions not just focusing in on one aspect of it you brought together the biochemistry the biomechanics you're tying that in with breathing we were talking about breath tolls we we're talking about influencing the autonomic nervous system stressing it when we want to but also down regulating it when we want to as well you spoke about sleep like surely these are the major functions that are absolutely necessary and states necessary not just for sporting ability but for overall quality of life yeah i agree i agree um, and, I'm, I, and, I, and one, one thing i'm really thankful for your word because again if you are not writing all these uh, books then uh, most likely most of us would never hear about it. And well, so that's, that's pretty let's, good. Let's see the next one. That's <laughs> yeah. I, I know you, you will not comment on this. <laughs> it's enough. I say this. Uh, because I think it's a really important topic. And this is focus, concentration and attention span. And again, society has demanded that we can achieve these states, but nobody has really taught us how. The warriors of old had it. They understood focus. They understood that mental agility to be completely immersed in the present moment, almost during uh, combat, that everything slows down, that they can read their opponent. And 
sometimes I feel it's been lost, but maybe it's time to get back to basics. I just had an opportunity to have a small interview with uh, with three, uh, three Olympians. Uh, and one of them, uh, I was working for Under Armour for a project, so I could sit down with these three legends and uh, a very champion in swimming, uh, uh, two times Olympic uh, champion in fencing and a European champion in judo. So I could pick their brain and they recorded it, so now it's a program. And then I, I asked them, what are they doing before the day of the game? And it was very interesting. I mean, all three of them, we're talking about about uh, breathing exercises. Wow. They all three mentioned, and one of them has a PhD from a psychologist. So that's pretty cool, the, the fencer guy. So it's pretty amazing. Oh, yes. But they all mentioned that they, they try to completely uh, get out from the game type of mindset. Yes. And they're playing cards, they're reading some very easy literature. Um, if they can, they play some snooker because that's what they make them uh, happy and joyful, yes. but nothing about their own sport and some breathing exercises. And, uh, and that's it. They, they try to sleep as, as good as possible. Yes. Yes. And that was very eye opening. And, and yeah. we, we try to show people that if these three people are uh, using these techniques, yeah. uh, probably you should too. Yes. Like as an Thank average you. person. And again, can you imagine it if you were constantly thinking about the event all day, every moment before, you know, the day before the event, you'd build it into something so big that it would scare the life out of you. Mm -hmm. And that's where the mind, you know, that's when the mind is defeating. It's the mind can help us or it can sabotage us. And for many people, it's, it's, it sabotages their ability. And there's um, one more thing. I'm sorry yeah. to say that, but but you know, many times they tell them, and they think they when they say this, they solve the problem. They tell them just why don't you meditate, yes. and and they try. I asked all of those people, why don't you meditate? And they, I really I try, but I cannot really comprehend what is meditation, because the moment I'm not trying, I'm trying to not think of anything. I'm thinking of something, and that pisses me off. That's what they told me. Yes. It's like at the end, I'm so angry that I just, I just leave it like that. Yeah. 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 Like I think meditation is wonderful, but I think there's a role in terms of calming the central nervous system for people who find meditation difficult. And also can you adequately meditate if your body is in a state of fight and flight, if the respiratory physiology is off, if your sleep is off, you have agitation of the mind and med meditation isn't going to fix that. So let's go back to the, you know, the hierarchy of needs in terms of looking at deep sleep is fundamental breathing and functional breathing. And then we can bring in mind and body aware. Um, it's been a pleasure, Peter. And um, it, I think as I agree with Daniel, some great nuggets of information there. Yeah. And Daniel as well. Thanks so much for, for joining us. So yeah, guys. So Peter, how can people make contact with you? Well, most of the info yeah, go ahead. You're an oxygen advantage master instructor as well. So Peter gives training in Hungary in oxygen advantage and also in the Buteco method. And this man has many talents in terms of your other um, disciplines as Krav Maga and Strong First. Yes, sir. And for people to reach out to you. Especially this part I will show to my teenager kids, okay? So they will have a pretty high <laughs> opinion on me. Now, yeah, so so if you try to reach me, I mean, you, they, they can reach me through your website, any of your web, website, because I have my bio there and my, my email address. All the rest of the information is, is all in Hungarian. So that for most people okay. who are listening this probably and speaking, uh, English and uh, not Hungarian the second language, probably they will not benefit from it. <laughs> no, it's great. It's been a pleasure. Thanks very Likewise. much, guys. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Thanks.